Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to my session today. I'm going to be talking about Camel K and Serverless. Um, my title has actually changed since I filled out the ApacheCon um, bio. So I was a specialist solutions architect. Now I have recently moved into uh, management in that area. I'm based in Charlotte, North Carolina. I've been working with Camel for I think about seven years now. Um, so I've been working with it a while and a little bit about me. I am an avid foodie. Um, I love wine and now I'm expecting my first baby in November. So a little bit about me. Hopefully with coming to Apache Con, you are somewhat familiar with Camel um, or if you attended the session before this in the integration track, I'm sure they covered a lot of it, but we're gonna do just a quick few minute intro to Camel itself, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, and that way also if anyone is unfamiliar, then we will get you familiar with Apache Camel. So Camel is a pattern-based integration that is Java-based. And it is really based on these enterprise integration patterns that are design patterns, for integration, best practices that have come to um, affect over the years. And there are all these different components, over 300 now, that you can use that are built into Camel for integrating with various different systems, running batch jobs, doing all sorts of messaging, web services, integration with the cloud, etc. There's also built-in data transformation. So if you're using JSON or XML, or if you're in healthcare and you're using something like HL7, you can do all that sort of stuff. And then when it comes to Camel, we write things in things called routes, and you can write those um, in Java or in XML. So depending on your team's experience in these areas, that can dictate how you actually develop. And then there's also native REST support out of the box for creating REST APIs as well as calling them. To give an idea of the components aspect, these are uh, some screenshots that I took several months back and it just gives an idea. I only got to L even when I was listing them on the screen. And so it gives an idea of what sorts of things you can integrate with out of the box. So you can read things like files, you can integrate with GitHub, and then you also have things like AWS and Azure also built in. So when we talk about integration patterns, this is an example of what an integration pattern might look like. We have an order that is submitted from some sort of order management system. And then we say, okay, let's split up that order by order item. And then each of those items get sent to the appropriate place to be processed, whether that's electronics or some sort of other area. Some other examples, if we aren't splitting orders up, um, maybe we need to aggregate something back together, or maybe we need to enrich something, resequence it, et cetera. And all of the enterprise integration patterns are really based on this book that was written years ago by Gregor Hope and Bobby Wolf called The Enterprise Integration Patterns. If we take a look at what that actually looks like from a code perspective, you have these simple examples, both in Java and XML. In this specific integration, we are taking a file, and uh, the data folder called uh, inbox, and then just sending it to a JMS queue called order. So you can have the same exact route written two different ways. If we take that a little bit further, we have an example where we pick up a file and then we split it by line. And then with each of those lines, we can change it to some sort of XML and then send that XML off to an ActiveMQ queue called line. So before we get into Camel K specifically, I also wanna talk a little bit about Quarkus, which is the default runtime for Camel K. So Quarkus is what we call supersonic subatomic Java. It is Java 
in the syntax that we know and are used to, but it has taken a route that now has significantly less resource utilization, which leads to this faster startup time and makes it a really great fit for utilizing serverless technology. And it can also be used with GraalVM. So what that means is if you use Corgus with GraalVM, it can actually compile your code down to native, similar to the way it would work with, say, C code. Um, and so what that allows is then, once again, that lower, uh, smaller footprint. And if you take an example of a dependency like Hibernate in a traditional stack, if you have um, a Maven project with Hibernate, it's going to have to know about all these different databases, you know, MySQL, Postgres, et cetera. Um, when it compiles onto native, what it can do is it can actually strip out all of the pieces that it doesn't need. It can look at your code and go, oh, well, I see that this um, application is using Hibernate, but it is only using it for MySQL. So I don't need any of the other stuff. So you can strip it out and then that leads to that smaller footprint. But one of the really cool things about Corgus is also the developer joy of having this live coding aspect. And so that is something that you'll see a little bit of today and the ability to um, edit, save, refresh your browser and see your changes. So we have this little cartoon over here. It says, wait, so you just save it and your code's running and it's Java? The developer's like, I know, right? Supersonic Java for the win. So there is definitely some advantages to utilizing it from a development perspective, because it's still standards based. You still have that unified configuration, but you have the ability to do the live coding and really streamline that development process. If we take a look at the resource utilization and the startup times, you can see how this breaks down from using our traditional cloud native stack. So think uh, Java with say Spring Boot as an example for just your REST and CRUD application versus if you were to switch that to utilize the Quarkus runtime with OpenJDK or utilize Quarkus using RHEL-VM, then you can see how it cuts down from 218 megs to 130 and then even further down to 35 as well as the time to first response being cut down from 9.5 to 2.5 to then sub seconds when you're using GraalVM. So when it comes to the difference between GraalVM versus OpenJDK, to get from the cloud native stack to OpenJDK and Quarkus, you're really just changing the underlying runtime to Quarkus. You're still going to build your code you know, pretty much the same way as you would in the cloud native stack versus with Growl, you're really using Growl to build that native executable. So there is a not, not really an extra step, but a little bit of a different way of building your code to then run. So this point, we do a little demo of how Camel can work with Quarkus. And at this point, this is based on the Camel Quarkus uh, subproject of Camel 3, which as I said, if you were in the session before this, they probably touched on that. And then we'll get into how all of that fits into Camel K and serverless taking everything a step further. So at this point, I am going to use a project called rest.json. Um, it is a Maven project. That is Camel Quarkus example. Um, and if I go in here, I have VS Code. And so this is my project structure. You can see it still has a POM file. Um, and then we have our Camel route over here. So it's extending route builder. This is a Java based Camel route. We have a list of fruits. And then we also have a list of lagoons. And then we have the route here that's saying we're gonna have an endpoint at slash fruits that uh, has a get and a post. 
And then we're also going to have an endpoint at Lagoons for get. And you can see um, these two objects just both have a name and a description. So pretty basic here. Um, so for this list, let's actually delete one of these to start. So that way we have something easy to add. So at this point, we should have three fruits and two lagoons when we start up this application. So to start it up, we are going to run a maven command called maven clean and then Quarkus dev. So this is actually going to start it up in that Quarkus development mode that lets us do the live coding. So, you know, initially it's going to compile all of our classes the way it would um, if it were to package this up. And then from there, it will actually start things up similar to, you know, if I were to do like a Spring Boot run, the startup looks pretty similar. Um, so you can see now it's listening on localhost 8080. And if I go over to my browser and go to localhost 8080 slash fruits, because that's where one of the endpoints was. And you can see we have our list of fruits here. If I go to lagoons, you can see we have that list here as well. Now, if I want to make a change, to add another lagoon and I'll probably just copy this. Let's add some peas or just pea. It's green, uh, it's earthy, and we can leave it as that. So now we just save the file. I don't have to do anything with Maven. Come back over here and I refresh my browser and it's there. So this really allows for that live coding aspect, that very quick feedback that then results in it being a really good fit for uh, serverless and in turn also Camel K that's going to be using a lot of that serverless style technology. Now we can really get into Camel K and how everything fits together. So Camel K is really taking what we know of Camel and making it Kubernetes native and really optimized for serverless. And it does have an operator. So that allows um, the operator to do some of the management of the Camel K routes, make sure everything's running properly, uh, can do the updates those sorts of things. And when we look at how Camel K can run, we can run it on vanilla Kubernetes. We can run it on OpenShift. So um, coming from Red Hat, because I am a Red Hat employee, I run it on OpenShift a lot. Um, or you can also run it with Knative. And so Knative is where we bring in that serverless aspect. And that can be used on vanilla Kubernetes or on OpenShift. So regardless of how you see it, um, there's various different ways to run it. Today, I will show you how to run it um, just on OpenShift without the Knative aspects. So it still is Kubernetes native, but not quite serverless. And then I'll also show you how to run it with the Knative serving and that full serverless superpower aspect. So Camel 3 projects, as I said, this was probably covered a lot more in the previous session. So check that out um, if you haven't. And here we're focusing on the Camel K aspect. And then what I just showed you is the Camel Quarkus. So it's not fully that Camel K, but it is use, utilizing the Quarkus runtime. When we look at performance of Camel K, we can see that the deployment is much quicker as well as the redeployment is even quicker after that. So the green in this case is the source to image. So that's taking the code from my laptop and having my laptop build it, create an image, 
and then put that image into some sort of Kubernetes cluster. The yellow would be taking a binary, so in this case, probably a jar file that I've already built. And same thing, taking that file from my local machine to create an image to deploy on the Kubernetes. And then the red is if all of that were to happen, the jar file was already up um, in the cloud, so localized to wherever my cluster is. And then finally, we have camel K that you can see is lower across the board. So how does all of this work? Well, with camel K, you actually only have an integration file. So with the project that I showed with the fruits and the lagoons, you still had a project structure. With camel K, that aspect really goes away um, as far as how you deploy. So you just have your specific integration file. It could be a Java file, Groovy, et cetera, various different options there. And then you use a CLI, in this case, a camel with a K, to run that integration. And that CLI will look at your terminal and say, OK, I am logged into this Kubernetes cluster, or OpenShift cluster, and it knows where to run it then. Um, so assuming that you have installed the camel K operator on your cluster, it'll talk to your cluster, talk to your operator, and say, hey, I want to run this integration. Now, if you have any dependencies uh, in this integration file, so this one um, has a timer, DNS. But when we go back to that list I showed early on of the various camel components, say you were integrating. Um, with AWS or with files, like any of those sorts of dependencies, there are various flags you can add in the CLI to make sure that those dependencies are picked up. And you can also utilize that same method for if you're using any custom data structures, you can say, okay, here's my dependency of my project's data structures that you have in some sort of uh, Nexus repository or something like that. So from your dev environment, when you're utilizing this camel CLI and you make some changes, then you just run this camel CLI command again, and it essentially makes a live update. So not quite as quick as uh, the edit save refresh that I showed you with the camel corcus, but it's very much instantaneous still. And when you run that CLI command, it actually talks to the camel k operator to look at your integration custom resource that got created when you initially deployed it and then the operator does a very fast redeploy of your running pod that takes you know less than a second so it's very quick and the operator takes care of all of it for you some use cases for camel k or if you need to do more integration on demand, and this also fits in very well with serverless. So when you need something to be able to dynamically scale up and down and really be, have that on demand aspect, or if you have a batch job that runs you know, once a day, it doesn't need to run all of the time. That's a great use case for Camel K. And you still have the ability to have you know, reusable modules, um, do stream processing, IoT, all sorts of use cases. And so with that, let's look at how Camel K works on its own. So I have previously installed on, it's a little bit bigger. Um, so this is an OpenShift platform. So if anyone's unfamiliar with OpenShift, it's Red Hat Enterprise Kubernetes platform as a service offering. But here, as I said, with Camel K, it works off of an operator model. So I have my project, Camel K, my namespace that I've previously created. And I have previously installed a Camel K operator. So if you click on this, you see there's various provided APIs. Um, when you deploy integrations, they show up here. 
And then it also automatically creates an integration platform for you. If you want to create camlets, those are something also that are in here readily available. So in this case, I've previously deployed a simple integration. And I'm actually going to go over to my projects to show you what that looks like. So in my Camel K project, I have my operator running. As I said, make sure that my integrations have the right dependencies, that you know the right number of pods are running, they need to be. And then here's my simple REST integration. And so it is a REST API. If I just click on that route, I have nothing deployed at the root context, but I do have something at slash hello. So here we have our hello world API. And now let's take a look at what happens if we wanna update that API and that fast redeploy aspect. I can actually stop that camel corcus example because we aren't running it anymore. And so here I have a single Java file that this camel K integration is running from. It's a Java class called simple rest still extends that route builder class. And at this point, it's just a rest endpoint, a slash hello. It's saying it's gonna return some plain text. And then that plain text is gonna say hello world. Let's change it to say hello Mary instead. So I'm gonna save that file. And now I need to make sure that this terminal is logged into my cluster. So to do that, go over here, copy my login command. So this is logging me in to my OpenShift cluster. It already says that I'm using my project Camel K. If I wasn't sure, then I could list out my projects. It would have a little star next to the one that's in use. And so at this point, this is how I know I can redeploy. So as I run my camel CLI command, keep an eye over here at this pod and how quickly it spins up the new one and spins down the existing. So we're gonna do camel run simple rest Java. Single command. So you can see it's already scaling up and then now that deployment is already complete. So very, very quick compared to your typical deployment time. And now if I go back to my slash hello endpoint, should be able to refresh and now it says hello, Mary. So by utilizing uh, Quarkus under the covers and all these other aspects um, that Camel K is really optimized for containers and for Kubernetes, we get that fast redeployment speed. So as I said, all of that was without utilizing Knative, without going full serverless yet. So now let's take a look at where serverless and Knative fit in. So serverless, of course, is not actually without a server. It's just that it hides it from the perspective of the developer. Um, and so Knative is an open source Kubernetes based platform for serverless workloads. So that's what we're gonna be utilizing today. And there are two different components to it. There's the serving aspect and the eventing aspect. So the serving aspect is the ability to scale down to zero and or scale up as more requests come in. So that's actually the aspect that we're gonna focus on for today's presentation. And then the eventing aspect has the ability to have this message style integration, um, which can use various different backings. It can use Kafka, but it can also just, you know, use it, it without Kafka and just have Knative um, message style integration. And so in order to use Knative, we have to actually install an operator for that. So if I come back over to my 
which is cluster, and go to Operator Hub. If I search serverless, I've got a few options. We're going to actually go ahead and install the serverless operator. So I'm going to choose the stable channel. This particular operator is for all namespaces on the cluster. So if you install Knative, it installs it cluster wide. And then as updates come in, I'm going to say they're updated uh, or approved automatically. And I will click install. So while that installs, I'll talk a little bit about Knative serving. So with Knative serving, I can have a REST API deployed as a Knative service and have there be actually no, no pods, no containers until someone needs it. So when a request comes in, then a pod spins up, it has that service in it, and then that code can integrate with various other systems. All of that is only there when you need it. As more requests come in, then the amount of pods can scale up even further from there. And when there's no more requests, then it can scale back down to zero. Some benefits of utilizing this is instead of having to try and predict what your load will be like at various different times, you can actually have your pod scale accordingly all the way down to zero all the way up instead of all this guessing and that leads to a lower operational cost uh, faster time to market and then you're also reducing the packaging and deployment complexity as you saw with camel k we're going from a whole project structure to just a single file and then the flexibility for scaling on demand that goes into you know, avoiding some of that random prediction. And what this looks like from an operational standpoint is when you're guessing, you're constantly either over provisioning or under provisioning or both. So in this example, you know, most of the time we are over provisioned as far as capacity goes. And then during a peak time, then we're under provisioned. So if you aren't using serverless and say you have more traffic on the weekend, then you would have to either, you know, always be over provisioned except on the weekends or manually scale it or set up various thresholds manually. Um, so OpenShift can auto scale as can some other um, Kubernetes providers to auto scale based on say CPU limits, various things like that, but you have to actually set that up. So there is still that a little bit of that guessing game versus with serverless, it does all of it automatically. You don't have to set various thresholds to scale up and down accordingly. It's just as the request comes in, the containers scale up. So as you can see, um, if you're more optimized, with when and how to be provisioned, then in turn, you're gonna end up saving money. And so we talked a little bit about how Camel K works with the Camel K operator before I installed Knative, but how does it work once Knative is installed now? So in this example, we have the custom resource definition here. Um, in this case, the integration is actually using Knative. And so it goes to be redeployed with the operator. And then the operator can basically say, OK, are we using Knative here or not? If not, then we just create a deployment just like normal. If we are, then we're going to utilize Knative serving to create an actual service. And as we look at moving from you know, what we started this presentation with with normal camel moving all the way towards now camel k utilizing serverless you can see kind of this evolution of moving from services to microservices to serverless and more towards that single action aspects and from a technology aspect there is a lot of overlap 
with how you can utilize things with Camel K. So, you know, Camel K, you can use it just as a microservice. It doesn't have to be full serverless, full uh, function only. And you can use it with Quarkus. In this case, Quarkus is the default runtime, but you can run Camel K without Quarkus if you would like. Um, but just so you know, it is the default. And then once you add in Knative, we're really firmly in that serverless area. So let's take a look at how things change now that we have Knative installed on the cluster. Oh, looks like I got timed out. Go ahead and re-log in. Oh no. So what happens when we do live demos sometimes? Okay, let me try something. Okay, I'm gonna try this in a new incognito window. Okay, well, that is not good. Bear with me, folks. Um, in the meantime, while I take a look at this, um, I'm gonna try and start from a different link. But if we have questions um, as I try and resolve this, we can work to answer any of those now. Let me see. See any questions? This is how you prove this is not a video. Yeah, this is very accurate. Um, let me see. Expect to try and clear a cache. So that happens also when you use uh, demo systems. Gosh, yeah, it is not letting me log in. Well, I wanted to show you all what this would look like really cool with serverless and serving and it scaling down to zero. Um, but instead, let me see, I think I have a video of it somewhere. So I will try and find that very quickly that is maybe a bit more dated, but... Okay, hold on. Okay. Get this video queued up towards the end. Okay, I will have to find that later. It's still definitely not letting me in. I'll try one more time. Demo God's great. <laughs> okay, I don't know what is going on.
So do we have any questions apart from comments on how great this presentation was and it was truly great. We can really see the whole gamut of going through uh, from traditional command all the way to uh, serverless. And Mary, if you can't get the demo uh, running, don't worry about it. Uh, we can certainly um, paste a link to it later. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because I can yeah. definitely share that later. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So Maria, if you're speaking, you're on mute. There, there's some wonkiness on hopping today. So yeah. So any questions before we wrap this up? Well, in that case, um, next up is uh, Nicola uh, talking about uh, ca camel to camlets and um, new connectors uh, for event-driven applications. So that starts in a bit over 13 minutes. Um, be sure to go to the sessions tab and look under the integration tag and uh, join uh, from there. So thank you very much, Mary, for presenting. This was awesome. And thanks, everyone, for your attention. Awesome. Thank you.